Turning to tonight's talk, uh, mental health and the criminal law can be a vexed area. As many of us know, it's difficult to navigate and it presents challenges to all those involved in the process. We're extremely lucky uh, to have a very learned panel of speakers with us today who will cover different aspects of sentencing and sentencing appeals for those with mental health difficulties. From the needs of those with mental disorders uh, and optimising psychiatric input to the sentencing guideline, an update on recent developments in case law following on from Vals and Edwards, experts and their reports, uh, and finally, some practical tips for solicitors and other professionals. We would ask that any questions please be posed uh, in the Q&A function, uh, and they will be addressed to the panel at the conclusion uh, of all of the speeches. We anticipate the speakers will take us up to just before 7 p.m. if everyone is keeping within their uh, time, which I will make sure they do. And then there will be time for questions after that. So I hope uh, any of you have any comments or questions do join in, as I say, on the Q&A function. If I may introduce our speakers. Professor Pamela Taylor CBE is a professor of forensic psychiatry at Cardiff University, member of the Royal College of Physicians, fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and of the Academy of Medical Sciences. On behalf of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, she provided evidence for the Sentencing Council during consultation on the sentencing guideline and has been working on the Royal College of Psychiatrists response to the consultation on mental health law reform, which she will be talking about shortly. She researches, writes and edits, including the textbook Forensic Psychiatry, Clinical, Legal and Ethical Issues with John Gunn and the journal Criminal Behaviour and Mental Health. She's passionate about reducing imprisonment but by providing safer alternatives where possible and about both promoting individual research in forensic psychiatry and developing its academic base. She co-founded the research charity Crime in Mind uh, and she'll also set out in her uh, talk a bit more detail about that. Stella Harris is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers. She has an established practice representing children and women charged with murder and serious violent offending. Stella has particular experience of defending those with mental illness or where fitness to your capacity is an issue. Her cases in this area often include expert psychiatric and psychological evidence. And she was in the leading appellate case R and Ahmed involving the interface between life sentences, sentences for public protection uh, and hospital orders. Dr. Richard Latham is a consultant forensic psychiatrist working with community patients in East London. His expert witness practice is focused on criminal cases, including appellate work. He is an author of the Oxford Handbook of Forensic Psychiatry and deputy editor of BJ Psych Bulletin. Her Honour Judge Rosa Dean is the resident judge at Harrow Crown Court. She is a member of the Sentencing Council and has just completed a five-year term as Joint Director of Continuing Training for Judges and Recorders. Harrow Crown Court has developed protocols to try and ensure that the practical needs of young and vulnerable defendants are met. Uh, and finally, Dr. Laura James. Uh, Laura was admitted as a solicitor in 2006 and as oversight of the Howard League Legal Service for people under 21 in prison. She has a professional doctorate in youth justice and Laura has developed an expertise in advising and representing children and young people in penal detention uh, in relation to prison law, public law and criminal appeal matters. Laura is a committee member of the Association of Prison Lawyers the Legal Aid Practitioners Group and Carla. She's also a visiting fellow at the London South Bank University and chair of Legal Action Group. In 2019, Laura was awarded Solicitor of the Year by the first 100 Years Inspirational Women in Law Awards. Welcome to all our speakers and thank you. Um, we will begin, please, if we can, with Pamela Taylor. I'm going to share my screen. I hope. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for including me in the seminar today. I'm hoping to learn a lot as well as I hope contribute a little bit as well. And I'm particularly pleased to um, be representing, in a sense, Crime in Mind today. So, um, ooh, I can't get rid of my pictures. Sorry, I'm trying to 
just get rid of the pictures so I can see my screen. Um, what I thought I would do is to um, talk a little first, as I'm guessing that most people are attending um, are um, lawyers, about what it takes to be um, a forensic psychiatrist. We're all uh, medically qualified, which means a five-year basic um, training, and then the first couple of years after that are in highly supervised practice as a, a doctor, and then you start to move into the specialties, so you have three years general professional training in psychiatry, trying a little bit of all the branches of psychiatry, and then providing you pass your membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists exam, you're qualified to go into higher training. And that higher training for us would be all about forensic um, psychiatry. And um, we are just revising the curriculum with the G GMC at the moment, um, but you can um, call up the curriculum on the GMC website, the old curriculum. And these are the main areas that we have to, to cover our professional values. And it's important, um, <clears throat> I think there to say that we're functioning as doctors so that our primary ethic, ethical position is that we're there for the patient or the presenting person, but we always do have to take account of others. And um, in standard medical practice, as well as in forensic psychiatry, if there seem to be substantial risk to other people, um, that might override some of the duties to the primary patient, um, like confidentiality, um, times of a pandemic make you think of um, infectious disease control, um, competencies uh, would be another area if somebody was incompetent, perhaps not competent to drive in the context of epilepsy. So th those are our professional values and we, we abide by reflective practice so that we can um, think about that and monitor each other to some extent. Um, the professional skills <clears throat> are very much around communication about all of the um, medical skills because our patients tend to be very complex. Um, and about managing that complexity and uncertainty too. We have to li live with uncertainty. There's no yes or no in our world, um, no guilty or not guilty in a sense, um, but a, a range of, of, of probabilities. And that's quite a tricky thing to work with. Um, we have the professional knowledge, which of course is, is, is medical, but here we would add law and knowledge about other relevant agencies. Um, health improvement and illness prevention. And here, of course, some of the special areas of our work are acknowledging that some of the institutions where people go can in themselves be quite harmful. There's, there's no intervention that doesn't have its downside. Um, and so we have to work to minimize any negative aspects of, of what we do. Leadership has to be learned and earned. It's not of any kind of right. And teamwork is vital because you need a very rounded perspective um, of offender patients in order to make good judgments. Um, patient safety and quality improvement speaks for itself. Safeguarding vulnerable groups. Most of us at some stage or other work with victims um, of crime and victims of all sorts of other things, including miscarriages of justice. Um, so we're very sensitive um, <clears throat> to victim issues and um, we have to be aware of um, laws on safeguarding too. Um, education and training speech for itself and research and scholarship comes to an extent into um, the work of Crime in Mind, which is a, a fairly new charity, which John Gunn and I set up. Um, the registrar is Ricky Garg, who may be known to uh, many of you, and um, our administrator um, is Dave Long. Um, so why did we do this? Um, well, um, we, we need to have um, information about what we're doing, which is um, constantly amassed by replicable um, methods um, so that we can check out that the information is, is accurate. And we need that to be able to understand the causes and the course of diseases and how treatment might impact and what the wider implications are. There's been a general um, low level of funding for offender patient research, but a concern is that funding for research is, medical research is falling generally across the country. Um, <clears throat> universities are funding less and less where <clears throat> the health service used to pick up some of the slack, it's no longer doing so. And the smaller specialties of course get disproportionately affected. 
Much research in health, though, is reliant on charitable funding. Um, think um, Diabetes UK, think um, the British Heart Foundation. There was no dedicated charity of that kind to fund research into mental disorders and offending. And so that's where Crime in Mind comes in. <clears throat> and we think and hope that in addition to raising monies for important research, that it does bring some respect for the field and reduction in stigma for the sufferers, um, perhaps through bringing um, the hope that research can bring. And, oops, I moved on to. Um, so these are the aims and objectives um, of the charity. Um, we think big and bold in the first instance. Um, we, we do recognize that this will take some time to achieve, um, but um, we um, aim to establish an Institute of Forensic Mental Health Science at a university somewhere, and to give the scientific study of mentally disordered offenders a much firmer financial base and position in society. And then things that we're going to be doing soon is to commission studies of the scientific and economic aspects of mental disorder related crime and various things that we're doing right now, increasing public understanding of the medical aspects of crime and its consequences, assisting training of all relevant um, professionals, lawyers, as well as clinicians and so on. And of course, we need to raise money for all this and fairly shortly we're launching formal membership. Um, these are the themes in research that we've been following um, so far, um, trying to, to, to keep some sort of um, structure in the system. They're not necessarily the most important things, but, but they're areas where we have very little knowledge and it's important to continue them. The breaking discrimination barriers might be particularly interesting to people because that's very much about how people with mental disorder may be particularly disadvantaged in the criminal justice system, perhaps not having access to um, criminal justice programs and so on because they find it difficult um, to manage them. These, um, the, the current um, status of, of these programs was put together in a special themed issue of uh, criminal behavior and mental health, which is accessible if anyone wants to take that further. Um, of course, I want to ask if you, you can help. We're looking for skills, we're looking for funds. You might have other bright ideas about help. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Now, the two main things for today are about the Mental Health Act um, white paper and about the Sentencing Council guideline. And I've been asked just to introduce those um, so that um, we, we've got a basis for discussion. There's still time to respond to the white paper just in case you haven't and would like to. Consultation ends on the 21st of April. So the principal drivers behind um, reforms um, were concern about overuse of detention under the Mental Health Act for treating people with mental disorders, concern about possible discrimination that the um, legislation was being used disproportionately with people from black or um, in this country, uh, ethnic minority groups, um, failings in respect for services with people with intellectual disability and other neurodevelopmental disorders were also an important um, driver. So those three main things. If you just look at the figures though, Almost all the increase in um, use of detention under the Act was in one sector, and that was in the civil provisions of the Act and uh, where people were be being detained on 28-day orders, which suggests that it's mostly about people who were coming to the hospital too late for treatment. They were too ill by the time they arrived to be treated um, in a voluntary way. So it's probable um, that there's a service deficit that is explaining a lot of that. Now, these are some of the key proposals for change um, that um, the Act in Future would exclude people with neurodevelopmental disorders from civil detention, not from detention under part three of the Act. That there would be an increase in access to or frequency of tribunals, an increase in the power of tribunals, um, replace this rather bureaucratic concept of the nearest relative, which no one has very much liked, with a so-called nominated person, so that the, the, the patient would actually have much greater say in who that is. That, of course, is much more important in the civil parts of um, the Act, but it will have some impact 
um, in the criminal parts, uh, that person would have a role in relation to tribunals, for example. Increased use of lay advocacy and what I'm calling legal micromanagement. And by that, I mean um, that there's a number of proposals, many proposals to make steps in the treatment process um, follow a particularly legally required pathway. And um, for a judge probably sitting alone in a tribunal to make decisions on um, compulsory treatment. So there's, there's a lot of legal, small legal detail there. There's nothing in the act um, that tackles the key issue of resources. In the preamble, um, there is a statement to the effect that the government is investing a lot more in mental health service but there's nothing to hold people accountable for good enough service provision. Now, our principles as forensic psychiatrists are that there must be a reasonable prospect that the specified problem can be dealt with by legislation, not everything can, and that the reform would not unduly divert culturally exceptionally scarce resources into bureaucracy and legal matters. It costs a lot to run tribunals and to follow um, the, the details required for some of the, the proposals, and that has to be taken into account. The areas I think that would be particularly interesting to discuss at some point this evening are around the business of neurodevelopmental disorders and what it, what it might mean if there were to be uh, legislation that they, only those people who are offenders may be detained under mental health law on these grounds. Is that discriminatory? Um, I'm asking you a question, I, I, I don't know, but it feels like it. Um, is it, um, and, and the white paper is very hot on asking for unforeseen consequences, is an unforeseen consequence um, that um, people who might have been detained under part two of the act um, will miss out on um, certain aspects of treatment, might even be pushed into an offending pathway because there is no other available way of getting them into hospital. So it's not denying that we have a current problem, it's questioning whether this proposal is going to solve it or whether there will be unforeseen adverse consequences. On the matter of tribunals, um, we were quite happy, I think, as psychiatrists to think that there might be more aspects access to tribunals, but our patients and carer reps um, were adamant that um, they didn't really want any more. In fact, quite the contrary, um, they probably wanted less and what they would like, please, um, is much more op option on controlling um, access. They'd like the right to cancel as well as to have a tribunal and they'd like the right to defer. And um, they would specifically like tribunals to be of much better quality. And by that, it, they seem to be meaning principally that they were not adversarial. Um, uh, I think they're not really intended to be, but most patients feel that they come across that way um, and that they have greater options um, within the, the tribunal. In particular, one of the issues that came up was uh, about people who are on recall, who are entitled to um, a, an early tribunal after the recall, um, most of the patients would want that deferred until a time when they think that there is a real, realistic prospect um, of, of an option on discharge. We advocated for increased tribunal powers and they are recommended. They're, in particular, we welcome, I think, um, the possibility of transfer between levels of secure hospital care so that people don't get stuck at high security. With respect to lay advocacy, I think it's interesting because there's a suggestion that they should have many more powers, uh, but patients were very clear that the whole point of an advocate is that it's a person not in authority and thus maximally approachable and able to help the patient express his or her own views. The silence on the hybrid order. Now, an important initiative, um, the Sentencing Council guideline, I think we really welcome it, not least because it tacitly acknowledges high rates of mental disorders uh, uh, among offenders. And I think for me, these are the two main planks. Rose is going to talk about it in much more detail, making the punishment fit the crime and as far as possible ensuring public safety. 
Where we have possible medico legal differences, it's on this question of punishment. We totally accept that that's what judges are required to do. Um, but we still want to push gently to say, don't we need evidence about what punishment achieves? Many offenders have come from really quite brutal and punitive environments. And we've got a lot of evidence um, that that kind of structure adds to risk of violence and offending. By contrast, there's some suggestion that some sanctions may be a useful part of um, behavior changing only when they're linked clearly to behaviors which were in the control of the offender patient and generally linked closely in time to them. And within the criminal justice system, there's also some evidence that moving outside an adversarial approach for offenders with mental disorder and attempting engagement the, the, the judge actually attempting engagement with them may be the best approach if safety and assistance from offending are really the key concerns. Um, one patient was saying, I don't want to disappoint the judge. Um, so they really did feel like there was some engagement. So questions around this issue of punishment. On the matter of public safety, I don't think there's anything to choose between us in terms of the will to secure it. Um, just to say that we have too little um, research quality evidence on best fit between um, offender patient characteristics and the pathways. And then this anomaly of the section 45A, which we're going to come on to in much more detail. It's uh, one of its many names is a hospital and limitation direction. And I think we want to be very clear that it's a prison sentence and it's a prison sentence given to someone who's in immediate need of hospital treatment and who will therefore go to prison, but go to prison via hospital. Evidence on outcomes is minimal, but I think it's just worth reflecting on the likely clientele, somebody with mixed um, hard to treat um, mental disorders, a history of poor engagement with services, probably not yet remorseful, probably not a very likable person, but they get into hospital and they do start to respond a bit to that. They start to recover, they start to engage. And what happens then is that they get their chance to go to prison. It seems a strange thing to do. There are of course related issues in terms of longer term management with people sentenced to long term imprisonment who have found in prison to have disorders, they get transferred to hospital. And we find that the disorder is much more relevant um, <clears throat> to the offending than was ever considered before and how to deal with that group and the double jeopardy of uh, mental health review tribunals and paroles. So there's a lot to de deal with and a lot to get around. And I'd like to hand over to, I think Rosa is, is going to talk um, in some detail about the Sentencing Council guideline. Could I suggest, I didn't have any PowerPoints this afternoon, I'm sorry, but could I suggest that you have a copy of the guideline in front of you? Uh, and by all means, switch me off from your screen uh, and have it. Um, as you can see from uh, the heading, I'm the resident judge at uh, Harrow Crown Court. So uh, we are a court which has its own uh, liaison and diversion practitioners. And could I just let you know this if you don't know it already, whenever we have a new case that comes to us at the Crown Court, it's booked in by admin. Admin will look at the better case management form from the magistrate's court and will actively look to see is there a mental health issue in this case and if there is we will upload our protocol but often we don't have that information we want you to have a protocol because we want you to be thinking early early doors about the needs of, of your defendant and we want to know because uh, there's no secret here you get priority as far as listing is concerned and we will actively try and list the case appropriate, appropriately for your defendant. So we want to know what's going on and please um, try and get as much information to us as soon as possible. And can I also urge those of you who are um, at a court with a, a liaison diversion team to make most of them. They are completely independent. They're completely separate from the judiciary. They're separately funded. They're a wealth of information they can unravel all sorts of contacts for you. They can provide reports and get reports for you. So just please make, you, play, please make use of them. Now, um, you already know that the Sentencing Council is an independent body. You already know that the aim is to promote transparency and consistency um, in sentencing. Uh, and you may know that the Sentencing Council has uh, 14 uh, members 
uh, uh, headed up by the Lord Chief Justice, the Chairman being uh, Lord Justice um, Holroyd. The Sentencing Council is now um, 11 years old uh, and you will all know that the large focus of the Council's work over the last 11 years has been offence specific. Although there are general guidelines for domestic abuse, totality uh, and imposition, the most underused guideline of all, please use it. Uh, and of course there's only one specific guideline for a group of offenders which has been children and young people and I think that is a very well received and very well used guideline and we want this new guideline for offenders of mental disorders, developmental disorders, neurological impairments, not an easy title uh, and the title reflects um, the sensitivities of the subject but we want that guideline to be um, as well used and as well thumbed as the children and young people one uh, and the fact that this is really the second a, f a group, as you were, specific guideline perhaps just uh, enforces just how important it is to the Sentencing Council that there was this guideline. Uh, and of course the reason for having a guideline, it, let's be candid, um, this is not an area that judges find easy. We don't come from, well some judges do, but most of us don't come from mental health background. Um, it's not an area I suspect many of you find easy. What guidance there was, um, was not in one place. And courts are seeing a very large number of, of offenders, as Pamela has said, uh, with a whole range of vulnerabilities. Now, um, I entirely accept the point that it may well be that uh, we're now finally talking about the fact that we have all these vulnerable um, defendants, um, but we plainly do, uh, and we need to make sure that we treat them fairly and as individuals and get the sentence right uh, and we're only going to do that um, if we start work early uh, and we know what a general uh, approach should be and we have some consistency and transparency about it. The guideline is emphatically not designed to change sentencing practice. It's not designed to push a sentencer one way um, or the other. Um, but that does not, of course, mean uh, that there haven't been some very important cases. Uh, and can I remind all of you, if you don't already um, have it to hand, uh, about the very important judgment um, from uh, the Lord Chief Justice, the Chairman of the Sentencing Council, Lord Justice Holroyd, and Lord Justice Fulford, uh, another member of the Sentencing Council and the Vice President. And that, of course, is the case of the Queen uh, 2019 EWCA CRIM 2286, the Queen, Queen VPS Dahir and CF, that's how I've characterised it. You'll all be very familiar with it. Now, um, as Laura will know, this of course was a case concerning um, young defendants, and these guidelines are for adults only, but the principles are uh, the same. Uh, and if I can just remind you just very briefly about um, that case, one of the uh, appellants had um, committed a joint enterprise murder aged 14. At his appeal for the first time the court considered evidence uh, about uh, his being on the autistic spectrum and having a very severe ADHD and the Court of Appeal found that that substantially reduced culpability. It may be some of you here tonight were involved in that case but it's a good example, isn't it? But it's not about how I always thought about it 10 years ago. Why would you have a psychiatric report unless it's a question of a hospital order? It's actually about understanding that someone's mental disorder impairment um, might actually be relevant to culpability. So it's an important case. Uh, and of course, another defendant uh, who had a whole host of problems had committed a section 18 uh, but this was a defendant who was a refugee, his parents had been killed, he'd been brutalised, he'd had everything that could possibly go wrong go wrong for him uh, and unsurprisingly he had a diagnosis uh, of very uh, complex uh, PTDS, PTDSD. Uh, he had all sorts of problems uh, and what the Court of Appeal said was that the judge was so focused on dangerousness, which you'll understand is always um, a concern for a judge, that lost sight 
that all those problems had a substantial reduction on culpability. So it, it, the guidelines are not intended to change practice, but you may feel that there is, a, a practi in practical effect, a bit of a sea change. And there's certainly, I think, in my own practice, a sea change, because I'm not going to be saying to you, if you ain't going to hospital, I don't need a report. I'm going to be asking you, what does this go to? Does this go to culpability, or does this go to personal mitigation and the impact if it has to be a custodial sentence or if it's on the cusp of a custodial sentence. So um, again, um, needing to get it at right at first time means, please, making sure that the court has um, all the information it needs um, early on. Now, um, the guidelines, uh, of course, are intended to be um, extremely uh, practical. Uh, they are also really designed to really encourage everyone to think uh, about the needs of an individual defendant. I think people sometimes think guidelines are tram lines and it's all about you know sentencing by numbers. It's not. It's got to be individualistic. Uh, and I hope you'll all welcome that the guideline actually addresses the problem uh, of race and the intersection of race and gender. Uh, the discrimination that Pamela uh, talked about uh, and I hope everyone will look at the Equal Treatment Bench Book for more uh, on that. Uh, again, um, the starting point when looking at the guidelines in terms of the general approach is just a, a reminder not to make assumptions about anyone, not to assume because a problem hasn't been diagnosed or identified before that there isn't a problem to think very carefully. You know your clients better than we do, <laughs> much better. You need to be thinking about and letting us know and investigating where there might be an issue uh, without making assumptions yourselves. Please don't be rushing off necessarily to get an expert report where there is already a lot of information available. You may have old school reports, you may have all sorts of information already on the system from the GP. Please just get it and get it soon. Uh, and of course, um, the very next question will be, might this uh, condition reduce culpability? And please just refer to the guideline. It's all there for you, paragraph 15. Did the impairment and disorder impair ability to exercise appropriate judgment, make rational choices, understand the nature and consequence of their actions? In 99% of cases, it won't. But in that important 1%, it will. Uh, and we need to make sure that we uh, spot those. There's also an awful lot there about the problem about um, comorbidity and the like and self-medication. It's all there in the guideline. It's all been uh, thought about to help you. Uh, of course, um, even if culpability isn't reduced, an impairment, of course, um, could be highly relevant um, to the sort of um, order that's appropriate uh, and in terms of personal mitigation if your client is someone who, for example, has autism and that manifests itself uh, by finding loud noises, very difficult, for example, a prison sentence is going to be a living hell. And we need to know because that is plainly relevant. Uh, and finally, of course, um, Pamela talked a little bit about this, didn't she, in terms of um, dangerousness. The guidelines um, do follow Bowles and Edwards. Uh, and the guidelines do give some practical help to the sort of questions judges will be asking um, in terms of dangerousness and in particular when you're considering uh, restriction. So um, I hope really, um, in a nutshell, just to encourage you to use these guidelines, please. Encourage all of us to avoid making assumptions. Encourage all of us to make sure that the defendants are properly participating in their hearing. Think about it early on. Um, ask for um, the um, time if you need it, get it right first time, is there an issue that has goes to culpability uh, and if so to what extent uh, and even if it doesn't go to culpability is it powerful personal mitigation, get us the information and hopefully um, you won't have to appeal us um, because nobody likes being appealed but obviously sometimes that's just the only course uh, available to you. So um, nothing can really replicate looking at the guidelines uh, but of course there were questions or criticisms about them so thank you very much indeed thank you thank you very much judge dean, thank you um, very much, judge dean. Um, i'll hand over now to, stella, hand harris, over now to stella harris please
Good evening, everyone. Um, I um, also don't have a handout for you, but um, I have reviewed some of the recent cases that have um, touched upon the interface between um, Section 41 restriction orders or hospi and hospital orders and Section 45A cases following on from Vols and Edwards. So just to remind ourselves of the criteria in those cases, um, Vols decided in 2019, uh, Lord Thomas said, said in, in that, set out there um, effectively a number of questions that the court is going to be considering when dealing with um, offenders who have... Um, who are in a situation where they might be receiving a either a hospital order or a hybrid order. Um, those questions really are, are, as, 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 are as follows. Uh, the extent to which the offender needs treatment, the extent to which the offending is attributable to the mental disorder. Thirdly, the extent to which punishment is required. And fourthly, the protection of the public um, setting out that there always must be sound reasons to step away from the uh, penal aspect of sentencing. Um, going on to state that the judges always need to consider the caref carefully the conditions about release when looking at protection of the public. And just because effectively there are two psychiatrists who are of the joint view that uh, section 3141 order is the right course that is never a reason to um to make such an order if the if there is a, a proper alternative so judges effectively reminded of their obligation to to consider their duty to also punish as well as um rehabilitate and um that case obviously has then gone on to be considered in the case of Edwards where Lady Justice Hallett makes a number of observations. What she effectively says there is there seems to be a, have appeared over the time, that case decided in 2018, that um, Vols effectively meant that um, the precedence ought to be for a Section 45A order, but that wasn't a case and in fact always, always the judge has to look about what evidence they have and who they are sentencing um, and what the, the order of consideration must be is considering whether a hospital order, the criteria is made out, then considering whether a section 45A order and effectively the penal element is something that needs to be considered and whether then there are sound reasons for stepping away from that. Um, the cases that I've, I've chosen just to set out for you um, this evening really do touch upon the tensions that we have when dealing with people who have um, mental illness, who come before the courts for serious offending. What are the aims of sentencing? Very wide considerations about really whether we're seeking to rehabilitate people or punish them. And how do we, um, and judges, consider protecting the public? Do they protect the public by assisting people in moving away from offending or by um, removing them from the public and, and ensuring they have the treatment that they need? So those tensions are at play in, in two cases, which I would, would just like to draw your attention to, really. Um, the first one is a case called Reynolds. And, that, and I, as I say, I'll, I'll put all of this in the handout so you don't have to take um, too many notes about it. Reynolds was decided in January of this year. And um, in Reynolds, um, this was a young man who had been uh, found guilty and given a 15 year sentence of imprisonment, made subject to a hospital, um, a hybrid order under section 45A. And the, the, the offending in that case by this young man were serious sexual offending against children. And um, effectively that began online and then escalated into, um, into, into um, meeting people and the like. So the, the grounds of appeal effectively were um, a number of matters about the trial and the, um, 
the sentence, but in principally that there was fresh evidence now. So the Court of Appeal heard from a psychiatrist who stated that now the, the better approach and sentence and more appropriate disposal was in fact um, a restriction order, section 40, 37, 41 order, rather than the hybrid order. And the per the, the this this um young man, his diagnosis, um, as set out in the sentencing remarks, was that he had been diagnosed as suffering from autism spectrum disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety and depression, um, albeit that the latter two were part and parcel of um, response to being arrested, response to the investigation and the strain of the proceedings. So, the, the, the psychiatric evidence, when considered by the court and, and examined with, through live evidence, was um, that the rehabilitation of this young man would be best achieved in a hospital setting under a Section 3741 order. And um, what the Court of Appeal thought about that um, is as follows. They, in effect, rejected that argument and they, they relied upon a number of, um, of facts to do so. Um, in a particular, facts are to do with, associated with the case itself. Um, what they described was that these were serious offences, that um, the appellant would be likely to require treatment for a long period of time. And, and they also commented upon um, his lack of empathy as to the, um, the victims in his case. And what they went on to say was that he had a high degree, notwithstanding that he was unwell, of culpability or responsibility for his offending. He had not faced, faced it, he had made excuses about it, he had mid sought to minimise it. And they considered that punishment was necessary, albeit, in fact, on the facts of the case, it was very likely that he would spend the most of his time and during the sentence in a hospital setting, they still considered that there wasn't a sound reason to depart from the penal element of the order because of the facts of the case. Um, they also mentioned in that, um, in their observations, that often uh, one of the reasons why an ongoing order under section 3741 might be helpful to the public is because there would be ongoing support, ongoing um, access to um, help and, and uh, supervision that extends beyond the sentence. But what they said in this case was there in fact was a sexual harm prevention order which could achieve those aims. Uh, and that case also looked at the guideline um, uh, as we've just been referred to, the 1st of October guide, overarching guideline, and particularly looked at Section 2, which is considering at the time of the offence, was the person able to exercise appropriate judgment? Um, were they able to make rational choices and decisions and understand the nature and consequences of their actions? Did their disorder or impairment mean that they behaved in a disinhibited way? And most importantly, were the factors in, in at the above relating to the culpability of the individual at their sentencing? So very, very much an emphasis on culpability and considering the interface between illness and criminal responsibility. Um, and that really brings me to the, to the other case that, um, that is a contrast in, in one sense, because here we have a very serious case. So this is a case that was also decided, in fact, it was decided last month on the 19th of March, and it's a case of Lau, um, appeal from the Inner London Crown Court. And this was actually an Attorney General's reference. So um, the judge in that court had imposed a Section 3741 order for um, a manslaughter case. The um, defendant in that case had been charged with murder, um, but convicted of manslaughter. 
And the Attorney General um, went back to the Court of Appeal and, and suggested that that was the wrong decision to make in all the facts. So the, the brief facts of that case was that the deceased was killed in what was seemingly a relatively random event on the street and was um, was um, sadly stabbed to death by the by the, um, the young man in this case, and he. Um, he effectively had um, a paranoid schizophrenia. He had been unwell for some time. He had not been taking his medication. Um, he had very limited insight into what had happened. And um, he also had been drinking alcohol. So those were features of the case which were plainly very serious and very concerning. And... Um, a, number, a very large number of psychiatrists were involved in the case. It was their joint view that, in fact, the best way of dealing with his health was still to go down the route of a Section 3741 order because he actually wore, his responsibility for the events was very limited because of his illness. And they particularly considered that his... Um, his non-compliance with medication, his lack of insight into being unwell, actually were principal features of his illness. So again, it's very fact-specific here. and We always want to and need the help of our psychiatrists to try and actually explain to us and to help us to present the arguments to the judiciary at first instance um, to try and, and link those I, I, um, that illness, if we can, to culpability, or at least to try and touch upon those issues and understand, and therefore we can convey the the, the, the matters that relate to public protection. Because um, if we can assist somebody, um, we can also protect the public. So these were features that the lack of insight, the alcohol, all the matters that were. Um, considered by the court, but in fact were very much linked to him being very unwell. And um, the uh, the court in that case upheld um, the judge's decision. They decided they considered that she had looked at her responsibilities to impose a penal sentence, but had decided um, in the case in the circumstances of that case that the most appropriate disposal um, was a section thirty seven forty one order. Um, again, very fa much fact specific and using the help of the psychiatric team to actually consider what might happen um, upon release and, and during the course of the sentence. Um, I note the time, so I'm going to um, finish my talk, but all, all I would say in terms of, obviously we're all dealing with, in, in the our talk, appeal something that's gone wrong or maybe fresh evidence that has come to light while someone's been in custody or in hospital and um, I would really emphasize that the need to try and speak with our with your psychiatrists and try and understand and that really assist in presenting um, their evidence to the court. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Stella. Um, we'll move on now, please, to Dr. Richard Latham, who in fact will help us with uh, what to request from your psychiatrist. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, everyone who's attended and the other panelists. Um, I'm uh, a forensic psychiatrist who does the majority of my expert witness work at, um, at the first stage of proceedings, but have also uh, provided reports at the appellate stage. Um, I think the, the thing to start with is that, uh, and, and Pamela alluded to this, that it's we're used to giving evidence for welfare disposals as psychiatrists. And in many ways that accords with the general principles of medical ethics, because what we're giving evidence about is something that is not likely to cause harm to someone. And so this whole issue has created a big ethical problem for forensic psychiatrists or psychiatrists uh, because we are getting very close to punishment. And there is a danger that some psychiatrists by recommending a hybrid order, section 45A, are actually recommending punishment, which is why I would start from the position of saying we probably shouldn't ever be recommending it, but we certainly should be discussing it because we know from the sentencing 
guidance. And actually, uh, five years ago, we were presenting on Section 45A at our conferences after Vols. So this thing has been on our agenda for a long time, but I do think it's, it's a complicated area for us. Um, I, so uh, let me just cover a few things. Uh, culpability. What I would say is don't ask psychiatrists to give an opinion on culpability. Uh, the Reynolds case the psychiatrist came unstuck there in many ways because they tried to give an opinion on culpability. Now, the guidelines are incredibly helpful because lots of the questions and comments that are in there about judicial assessment of culpability can be translated into questions that might be put to the psychiatrist. Not all of them, but some of them can be. But I think culpability uh, addressed directly is really problematic for a psychiatrist, although sometimes you're pushed to do it. What I would say is that there are areas that we commonly need to explain, and these are in the guidelines. So actually, it makes it more straightforward to instruct psychiatrists. And those two things have already, to some extent, been covered. The notion of insight and the relevance of insight into mental disorder, the way that the person in front of you understands their own mental health problems, how that impacts on their behavior in terms of their intention to seek help, uh, in terms of taking medication and those kind of things. So I think that often is something that psychiatrists can explain and assist in the determination of culpability. And the second big area is the use of drugs. There is a sort of very uh, dim view taken both sort of morally and legally of anyone who uses drugs. But of course, we know that lots of, certainly lots of my patients use drugs and the reasons they use drugs are complex. Uh, they're not all entirely down to self-medication um, in a sort of dichotomous way. You know, it's either self-medication or it's uh, free will. But I do think there's a need to explain in some detail when you're a psychiatrist as to what the relationship is between the substance use and the mental disorder. So those are two sort of main things I'd highlight that might go towards culpability. The, the next point I want to talk about was causation and this link between the disorder and the offence. Because in science and medicine, Causation is a very high threshold. I mean, we've had it in the press recently with does the AstraZeneca vaccine cause blood clots? And, you know, it's a, it's a problematic thing to establish. And so the, the psychiatric equivalent, I would say, is about formulation. So when we look after people after they've been sentenced to hospital, we think much, much more about social factors. We don't just think about illness factors. We think about things in the round. Now, arguably, the court don't want to hear us talking about social factors, because that's not necessarily what they want from an expert and the rules of expert evidence. But I do think that there's a need sometimes as a psychiatrist to try and give your formulation, respect the fact that ultimately the court are deciding this, but give your overall view on things. Because the alternative is that you focus entirely on illness and you look like you, you got tunnel vision and that you only see everything through the perspective of of, of illness. And so I do think the sort of medical notion of formulation is quite helpful in terms of thinking about causation. I need to mention the regimes after release. So one of the things that has come up in these cases is what happens after someone's eventually released from custody. Are they going to be on license or are they going to be subject to a section 3741 uh, conditional discharge? Now I'm a community forensic psychiatrist I'm wary this is being recorded and it'll be put back to me, but I am probably somewhat biased towards what I do. I think we do a pretty good job. Now, it's also worth noting that it's one area of the NHS where there's quite a lot of funding at the moment. I am uh, partly working as a commissioner and we are funding community forensic services uh, to uh, a pretty... Uh, a pretty admirable tune at the moment. We are, we are giving lots of money to these services. So actually those services are pretty good. The problem is, and I draw attention to the limitations of this, is that when you ask a psychiatrist to compare the regimes, most of us don't have such a good understanding of what it's like being on license. Now I have some patients who are also on license, so I can compare from my own experience, but it's very difficult comparing those regimes. There are some things though that I will talk about and often it's about dispelling myths. Some of them are about the mental health tribunal, that that's an easy ride, that they just let anyone out um, as soon as uh, you know they've, as soon as 
people, the psychiatrists given up on them, they let them out. And that just isn't true. And I think there's often a need to explain what happens in a mental health tribunal. And although it is not like the parole board entirely focused on risk, the tribunal does not ignore risk. And so that's something that I will often explain. Because when I give opinions on the regime, I will talk about the difference in the actual process of release, so the, the, the tribunal parole board process and what happens if someone stays in hospital, what happens if they do end up going to prison and how psychiatrists will be involved then. And then I talk about what happens after release. And one of the problems that I also highlight is that when people are on license, although they are of course entitled to psychiatric care and treatment, the reality is it's quite difficult to get them that. Now that probably shouldn't be a reason to choose a hospital order, but if you want to guarantee that this person is going to get some treatment for the longer term, the only way to do it is a hospital order with restrictions. Um, I think um, I, I'll make a couple more points because I'm aware that we're sort of, um, uh, we want to leave time for questions. With all of this, and obviously the Vols judgment and the subsequent judgments highlight that ultimately the decision is for the judge. And of course, that is obvious in the criteria because the criteria, the medical criteria that I have to effectively certify or say are made out are identical for section 37 as they are for 45A. And so Although there are then additional things that I might comment on, like the things I've described, I think there is a need, and this of course doesn't need to be done sycophantically, but I think that the psychiatrists really need to be aware, and if you're a lawyer instructing a psychiatrist, make them aware that this is ultimately not their decision. And that, I suppose, takes me back to my very first point, that, that you can in many ways as a psychiatrist just discuss the relative risks and benefits of each of, for example, the regimes after release, and then acknowledge that ultimately the decision is for the court. Um, because I, I do think this is a problematic area to sort of say, I think this should happen. Um, I think I have covered most of the points that I wanted to mention. The, the final thing that I wanted to say is that the, the the sentencing guidelines, I, I think, are very welcome and that what they can help when it comes, what they can help with when it comes to instructing psychiatrists is giving psychiatrists very clear instructions, because I think this is a complicated area ethically. I think there was a real danger of us overstepping our role. Um, some judges will make it very clear that you're overstepping your role and you need to get back where you belong, the other side of the line. But actually, a, a very good instruction letter will mitigate against most of these problems because um, I, I have an interest in this area and there are a few other psychiatrists who have an interest in this area and they will be up to date with these cases and they'll have read them and they'll be aware of where the problems may exist. But the majority of psychiatrists you, in, psychiatrists you instruct whilst they will be aware of these issues, it will probably help if you instruct them clearly so that they stay the right side of the line. And then I think they will be um, better witnesses. They will be more, but not just for the side instructing them, but better witnesses for the court because they will be respecting the line between what they can assist with and the ultimate decisions that the court need to make. Um, I will stop there so I don't run on too long um, and I'm happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on finally, please, to Dr. Laura Jades. Laura. Thank you very much. And um, to all the other panellists, really fascinating um, contributions so far. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen and whiz through a few, a few slides. Um, speaking in my capacity as legal director at the Howard League. I'll have to tell you a little bit about that because I'm always obliged to do that. And the context of prison today, as, as we heard from, from Judge Dean, um, it can be a living hell for people with mental disorder. Uh, then from a very practical point of view, um, how we go about spotting um, vows type cases, um, the important conversations that you need to have with your client because of the consequences of switching to a hospital order. Um, and then the sort of practical steps in terms of who you need to talk to, um, identifying, instructing an expert and uh, a few sort of um, 
tips in terms of hearing hearing preparation. Um, so um, very briefly then, uh, the Howard League uh, for Penal Reform has been knocking around since 1866 and it works for uh, less crime, safer communities and fewer people in prison. We try and achieve that uh, by a combination of uh, policy uh, research, direct legal work uh, for young people aged 21 and under, which is the Department um, of Extraordinary Women Lawyers that I head up. And we have a free helpline where uh, young people can call us uh, directly from prison. And um, we are an independent membership organisation that takes no government funding. Um, so uh, mental health support in prison generally, I say generally because Obviously, these days, everything is, is very different. Um, so, But even um, when the chief inspector was reporting sort of on the year before the pandemic really got going, um, I think it is summed up by the fact um, that he said in his report, um, of basically covering most of uh, 2019 and early 2020, that um, in approximately half of the prisons that were inspected, prisoners had inadequate access to mental health assessment and treatment and that in 21 prisons that they inspected there were long and unacceptable delays in the transfer of patients with mental health uh, problems to secure NHS beds and that absolutely accords with my experience in practice um, even as we speak, um, working with a very uh, young, vulnerable person who everybody agrees needs to be in hospital, no bed, um, sitting in prison, not getting the help he needs. Um, and now I turn to the current situation. If it was bad anyway, it's particularly um, awful during COVID. COVID sorry. <laughs> Um, you are in your cell at 23 hours a day with all your mental health issues and I have depression when you're by, your, by yourself you think of all this stuff and it hits you that's something that a young adult uh, said to me on our advice line uh, during the pandemic and it's very typical of what we hear also hearing from uh, young people who were doing well with talking therapies describing now getting a, a, a literally a check-in through the door of the cell every other week so um, and we, we've prepared a, a briefing on our website about young people's experiences in custody during COVID. Um, the reality is, is that the number of restricted patients is fairly stable, but in, as of December last year, there were uh, almost 8,000 restricted patients in hospital settings. But what's interesting to see is that 62% of all restricted patient admissions in 2019 were transfers from prison. So they were not getting uh, mental health disposals uh, routinely, but um, clearly either being in prison, they were becoming ill or, or they were in fact ill to start with. So, so how do we spot uh, cases where the disposal may have been wrong in the first place and we want to correct that on appeal? Well, clearly, uh, one of those many transfers to hospital may provide an opportunity for a clinical team to really get to grips with what's going on with a, a patient and see whether or not, in fact, all the things that Stella and Richard have just talked about in terms of enduring uh, mental illness and connection with the um, index events are in fact there. Um, so that's clearly a very good place. And many of the uh, VALS cases that I've worked on have started off with concerns raised by hospital staff. Um, clearly, um, you may have situations where there is a post-sentence diagnosis. It could be somebody is still in prison even of a pre-existing condition. Usually in those cases, you'll have to um, try and support them to get a transfer to hospital first before you can go about trying to switch the sentence. But in particular, autism is is, is a, an illness that I've found quite often diagnosed um, way after sentence once somebody is in an environment being monitored and some of those um, symptoms have, have emerged much more clearly. But of course, it's a lifelong condition and would have been present at the time of the offence. Uh, there are also instances where the discharge planning for somebody perhaps who's in hospital but on a on a prison sentence as it were then starts to reveal the inadequacy of the criminal justice system for the patient going forward um, that's particularly the case um, for people with learning disability who may need lifelong uh, care and and treatment um so uh, and then there are a couple of uh, categories that I just think the law doesn't cater for at the moment. 
Um, what about those who are clearly very unwell but are not transferred to hospital, perhaps because there isn't a space or because there is a conflict of opinions? And what about those people who are in the hospital pathway but are just about to get better, who won't technically meet the first of the VALS questions um, but clearly would benefit from a mental health pathway? So once you've spotted your client, you're going to actually need to have that very important conversation. Um, and it seems to me that before you embark on the very arduous uh, task of trying to um, substitute a, a prison type sentence for a, a hospital order, you, you really want to make sure it's something that the client absolutely wants. And so I've prepared for you here a sort of compare and contrast of the pathways of uh, hospital and prison. And when I um, do this for my individual clients, I tailor it to that particular person's sentence and what we know about them. And we go through it. Sometimes clients with learning disabilities, we work with their speech and language therapists to create a sort of pictogram to go through it with them. I, I won't go because of shortage of time here and we want to have uh, time for discussion with, through all of these things. But for example, um, it's such an individual decision. Um, some people um, really welcome and crave um, the care and support and um, attention that you might get in hospital. Others may find that excruciatingly intrusive, but just the very practical differences. So uh, the availability, much greater availability of Section 17 leave, which can be uh, increased um, at, at an appropriate pace without too many administrative hurdles compared to the very limited availability of release on temporary license from prison. Um, the absolute duty um, under section 117 to aftercare of somebody who is going to be discharged from hospital compared to, um, well, I've said through the gate, but that hardly exists anymore, compared to the lack of any guarantee, as I think Richard has already alluded to, of clear uh, aftercare and mental health support if you are leaving custody. So those are the sorts of things that we need to think about with our clients. Then, of course, we need to get on with the job of gathering all the information together. These cases are, it's really important to have a consensus. And actually, if the current responsible clinician is not on board, it's going to be very, very difficult and you need to manage your client's expectations very carefully. Um, but if the uh, client wants to go um, ahead of this, it's very important then to try and raise it at the regular six monthly care programme approach meetings with their consent, if appropriate, and see if the clinical team is actually supportive and what you can do. You'll need, of course, if you're a fresh solicitor to get the full defence file, the full medical records and other records. Sometimes, particularly if you're looking to see whether a condition is lifelong enduring, your expert's going to want to see potentially school, social care records, GP records. Um, and the other thing that's always quite a good idea is just to check with the Court of Appeal whether or not your client's already appealed. Don't assume your client will necessarily uh, know that um, because um, I have been caught by that before. So um, the Court of Appeal Office is quite helpful with that. Um, of course, identifying and instructing an expert, as we've heard from everybody today, is absolutely crucial in terms of getting all that information there. You're going to need an independent report if you're going to consider the four questions in VALS or, or, or the, the, the position in Edwards and the RC is unlikely to be able to cover this in depth as part of, of, of the day job. Uh, fresh funding is, is available um, under a CRM5 and that's usually fairly straightforward in these kinds of cases. I think it's always a good idea to approach and think about the psychiatrists who are involved at the time because you'll probably need to consult them in any event and gather gather their views on any post-sentence developments, particularly if it may be that they themselves have changed their mind, that may be very helpful. Um, and of course, you'll need to instruct an expert to deal with all four questions. And I'm not going to go through those because Richard has just done that so beautifully. Um, so finally, then I would just move on to um, the few sort of uh, top tips in terms of hearing preparation. Um, of course, the usual rules here, of course, apply. You've still got to contact your original solicitors and try and work out why this wasn't pursued at the time and any other questions arising in accordance with McCook and um, McGill. Um, the um, live evidence is almost always required in these cases, I find, from both uh, the independent expert and usually also the RC. So uh, just being aware of that and, and preparing um, for that as, as an ultimate 
outcome. I think it's very useful actually to consider having a pre-hearing conference with both experts to see uh, identify areas of agreement and disagreement and where possible to uh, present a joint statement to the court on those on the key questions and um, particularly on the aftercare um, and it's also um, usually quite a good idea um, to have a, a section 12 approved uh, psychiatrist who's who prepared the, the actual statement in terms of fulfilling the requirements of a, a Section 37 order so it can be substituted. The other thing I just thought I would flag by way of close, closing really is to consider anonymity, particularly if your client is on the road to recovery um, and is a high profile um, case and actually the um, publicity around a court of appeal case may undermine their recovery or treatment, um, then you might want to think about that as at a very early stage, but you will, of course, uh, need to gather appropriate evidence. Um, you, you'll see from most of the post-files cases, there has not been anonymity. So that's um, that's all I wanted to say um, so that we can have um, some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to all our panellists for your extremely interesting talks. And I think one of the best things uh, about this setup really has been that there's so many different angles, because any of us who practice in this area know that there's many different angles. So it's excellent that we've been able to pull together. And in particular, I'd like to thank um, Laura, because she was uh, a main the main person involved in getting all these eminent speakers together. So thank you, Laura. Um, we've had one or two questions posted and one of them helpfully actually is in three sections. So that'll keep us going for a little bit. Um, I, I'm afraid I can't see, I think it's um, Rona Friedman actually from Commons. I'm not entirely sure because some of the name is missing as to the, the posting, but I, I'll, I'll read out um, the question in three parts because actually it goes to different members of the panel. So I think the first part of the question actually goes to you, Judge Dean, because um, it's raising this issue of intermediaries which is a good point, actually, because it's effective participation. Judges need to be far more ready to allow defendants intermediaries for the entirety of a trial. It's alienating and discriminatory to allow the support for evidence giving only. I don't know how far you can answer this question, whether you agree, but what about this issue of intermediaries for defendants, um, particularly those with mental health uh, difficulties? Whilst that's resolved, the second question, uh, one for our psychiatrists, I think, um, can the forensic psychiatric community and psychiatrists working for the prison service, so in reach mental health teams, have far more effective lines of communication? I'm thinking of a case where one of the panellists emailed a prison lead psychiatrist asking him to urgently consider Section 48 assessment for transfer, no response. This man continues to be untreated and in crisis six months on. Um, in terms of your experience, if you've had to uh, get in contact with in prison um, psychiatrists, uh, Dr. Latham, uh, Professor Taylor, have you had cooperation? Is it difficult to get in touch with people in prison? I, I think one of the problems is that um, obviously I, I don't count uh, Pamela and myself in this, some of our colleagues have um, uh, sort of large egos. And I think one of the one of the problems is that if you are an expert witness, uh, the prison psychiatrist is usually the person who picks up that someone's mentally ill and refers them to hospital. And they, they often, do, you have to tread quite carefully in suggesting this um, because there is a sort of sense of you sort of encroaching on their turf. And so I I, I, um, I mean, obviously there's um, a 50% chance it's me and I know that Rona's talking about me, but um, uh, uh, so uh, it is problematic because you do sometimes go in as an expert witness and you see someone for two, three, four hours. You have a lot of time with them. The prison psychiatrist is unlikely to have had the benefit of that length of time. So you do sometimes meet people and you get out of the prison and the first thing you do is you try and get on the phone to the prison psychiatrist and say look this person's really unwell um, and you know there's no criticism but I think they really need some treatment and um, I I think it is it is problematic and those prison psychiatrists because there's usually one psychiatrist for each prison those prison psychiatrists are incredibly influential and they have I, they have quite a lot of responsibility for people because if someone is not transferred to hospital at an early stage, it really, I suspect, has quite a dramatic impact on the ultimate sentencing, probably the outcome of the trial as well, because there is a perception, well, they can't be that ill if they didn't get transferred to hospital. 
So uh, it, it is really tricky. I don't have an answer for Rona clearly because um, I've already failed with her um, <laughs> with her client. <laughs> That's right. She's given me a letter. I was going to say, I think she's absolved you, uh, Richard, judging from the chat. So I think you're all right. Um, Professor Taylor, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, I think it's. I think communication is a very difficult um, problem in this area all round because one of the other things that happens <clears throat> is that it's sometimes quite hard to think of the optimal placement for a patient. So the the patient may get referred to a general psychiatrist who comes along and sees the the, the, the prisoner and says, "Oh my goodness, I couldn't possibly cope with that in my service." So refers it to a forensic psychiatrist, and then it goes too high up the security ladder and, and, and then somebody else needs to go and assess. And it's one of the things that we're discussing in the college at the moment, how we could make that process simpler. And indeed, paradoxically, it may be one of the good things that comes out of the pandemic that now that we're much more used to um, using this way of communicating with people, um, that as long as someone sees the prisoner uh, in real life, and I think that remains important, um, that, some of the other negotiation can be done by this kind of technology and that might help a bit. The other crucial thing which came up when we were looking at the mental health reform stuff is, is how desperate the prisoners and the prisoners' families feel um, for lack of communication and, and begging that somehow um, they have a system where they can be informed whether anybody thinks they're suitable um, for transfer and, and what the delays might be about and when they might reasonably expect the transfer to take place. So there are a lot of things to think about and I think there are things that we could do to improve the situation. Thank you very much. Um, just to, to continue that, I think there's been posted, I think everyone can see that uh, from Tam Gill to all the panelists, that the Mental Health Act um, white paper addresses this specifically with the creation of an AMHP type role and much tighter deadlines to bring Section 48 assessments more into line with the statutory time scales in civil Mental Health Act admission. Uh, but the issue, as Professor Taylor has flagged up, is going to be funding, I think. We, so. we have recommended that there isn't a new person, that the funding oh. should rather be directed to, to ensure that people in existing health services take, key, take on the role. Um, but the, the other question, and it's, it's one that we've struggled with, is whether the time limit on transfer should be set in law. And, and that was one of the things that was looked at in, in the reform process. We've recommended against that just on the basis of unintended consequences. Um, obviously for some people, 28 days is too long. Um, but the problem is that unless we have adequate resource and it keeps coming back to resource, people will not even get recommended for transfer because people will deal with the prospect um, of getting into legal trouble um, by not getting the transfer through quickly enough by not recommending the transfer. And so ultimately it will disadvantage people even more. So we're back to this business of, is there any legal way in which we can um, improve the provision, um, the appropriate provision of resource? Thank you very much for that answer. I don't know if any of the panel have a, an answer to that particular uh, question posed. Um, I would just like to sure. say, unfortunately, I mean, I completely agree with the resource issue that, that Pamela says, and, and really there needs to be some kind of sufficiency duty on, um, on, on NHS forensic mental health resources to deal with that. But um, there have been quite a lot of occasions in, in, in my own career where we've had to prepare um, letters um, letter bef letters before claim um, in contemplation of judicial review proceedings for failure to assess and transfer and where there is a bed available or a bed can be made available, um, you know, that, that has been highly effective. Um, obviously, it shouldn't have to be that way. We don't want to have to do that, but that is an option. Thank you, Laura. Um, Judge Dean, I don't know, can we hear you now? Do you want to try? Ah, no, we can't. Um, I wonder if, if you're able to just post an answer in, in the chat in terms of Harrow. Ah, you can't do that either. <laughs> OK. Um, I hope that gets resolved at some point during the talk, but it, it, it may not. Um, I 
I'll pose the question uh, to Stella and, and Laura in terms of, it may be more for Stella really than Laura, in terms of intermediaries, Stella, um, in your own practice, have you seen an increase in the use of intermediaries? Are, are people more ready to ask for them? Are judges more ready to grant an application for an intermediary for defendants? Um, so, certainly, it's something that I, I think in serious allegations is almost routine as part of your checklist when you're defending somebody is you want to you want to know more about them and you want to understand particularly when dealing with young people whether they need any support in court so I tend to find that that um, we are able in those sorts of cases to to get the support that we need certainly for evidence and um, but it usually is only for key parts of the trial because of because of resourcing issues. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to move on uh, to another question from Bernbergs. Um, would it ever be appropriate to instruct a prison psychiatrist to prepare a psychiatric report for sentencing purposes? Is there anyone in particular in the panel who wants to answer that or anyone want, uh, everybody can dive into that one? I, I just want to make one small, small point because we keep talking about prison psychiatrists as if they're psychiatrists employed by the prison, and they're not. These Everyone is employed by the NHS. Uh, this was a, a, a very important change. At, at the bad old days, we did have prison psychiatrists, but now everyone is employed by the NHS. But they're people who run clinics in reach services into the prison. And I think that should make a difference. And I think if we're finding that... Um, people are employed by the NHS, but only ever working in prison so that de facto they become prison psychiatrists. That might be something that we ought to be getting a little worried about because I think the whole idea is that you have a, a foot in the NHS camp because that will help um, transfer arrangements. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it relates to another question that I saw about um... Uh, bias, which is something that I think forensic psychiatrists have become interested in increasingly over the last few years. And I, I think there's no problem in principle in instructing uh, a psychiatrist who works in the prison. But I think there, as I mentioned, there's a, you know, there's a danger that I might be slightly biased towards the idea of community care under Section 3741. A prison psychiatrist may uh, be inclined to slightly overstate uh, what can be offered in prison because mm -hmm. they will be likely to have some pride in what they do. And um, so I think you just have to, you just have to look at an individual situation. Um, it, it's more complicated if that prison psychiatrist is currently the treating psychiatrist. I think there is more scope for some kind of conflict there, but not necessarily. Um, so I, 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 as Pamela said, that, you know, there are, you know, the, people working in prisons are people who have, have worked in secure hospitals and are part of the same organisations that all the other forensic psychiatrists are part of. So I wouldn't veto it, but I think it's probably a matter for individual cases and, and sort of exploring whether there's a possibility of any conflict. And hopefully the psychiatrists themselves will say, actually, I don't think I should do this one because of this reason. It's also a question of timing, isn't it, as well, as you alluded to, that um, if you're able to get uh, an independent psychiatrist in the sense of someone coming in, they're going to have a bit more time and then they, you can always feed in the opinion of the um, psychiatrist working with the person in prison. Uh, thanks very much. I think Richard mentioned one of the questions that did refer to bias um, in the Q&A function. It, it's from Hannah Sinclair and it says, what measures can or should be taken to avoid bias against mentally ill offenders? who've committed crimes which are considered particularly abhorrent by society. I mean, again, I think that applies to anybody on the panel. So if there's anyone who wants to um, specifically address it, and I think it's getting at that situation, which we've all seen, I think, which is you read a case and you think that person was, was particularly mentally unwell, but then you see that the out, you know, the outcome is a, is a refused appeal and uh, either a section 45A or, or saying uh, imprisonment for public protection when they existed. Uh, or, or worse so is is there anything we can do as practitioners is there anything you can do as psychiatrists 
um, to, to avoid that because of the abhorrence of the crime. I mean, I can speak from the perspective of a psychiatrist, and I think that uh, we're obviously just as uh, vulnerable to this bias as well. One of the things that um, we have spoken about is the idea of peer review. So obviously not before you submit a report, it's not consultation for your report, but a peer review process. So we generally recommend that people don't work completely individually because some expert witnesses do, and then they never really get any peer review of their work. Um, some of the practical things I suggest to trainees uh, if I'm supervising them writing a report is to remove incredibly value laden terms because you will read psychiatric reports that and I'm guilty of this as well where you will use a word to describe an offense or to describe some behavior um, which is clearly value laden and in, and is is sort of biasing the reader automatically um, I, I think it's um, I think it's really difficult, but one of the first things is just saying to is it's just encouraging people to accept that they are likely to be biased. Because I think the most dangerous thing with bias is when people assume that they're objective. And if people assume they're objective, they're missing their own biases. And so it is, I think identification is the is the is the biggest hurdle. And once there's identification, doing something about it is much more complicated. Um, and of course, uh, this is a bit unfair, but um, with the technical problems, but of course the, the, you know, the, the problem of how you deal with bias in the judiciary is, is, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Because that's, because it's such a fundamental part that of, you know, that the, that the, that the judge's decisions are, are, objective um well actually we're hopeful because judge dean left and came back so we're gonna we're gonna try again let's see because now you've got two questions so they're building up so really hope that it right. works yay excellent can you hear me now yes we can right can i just answer the first question about intermediaries yes. yeah i'm sure the report really explains why an intermediary is used for the whole case because everyone's needs are different and um you really need to understand what the problem is and how it's an evolving problem. So, sorry, it's not expressed very clearly, but the reports we often get requesting intermediaries often start by saying, I'm an intermediary. The defendant tells me he'd like an intermediary. He should have an intermediary. We need an awful lot more than that. And um, it's, But it's a still a fair point. Second point about, um, uh, you know, help helping uh, identify the defendants who need to be moved on into um, leaving aside a question of funding it's not really for me but can I just say that if you have got a, um, a liaison practitioner that can be really helpful so the psychiatrist Dr Das at Harrow will often speak to the team treating at our local prison uh, and speak to them uh, and if necessary go and have the defendant produced to do a report and then have that kind of conversation find out what the problem is and I'd really recommend it, that's a very good use for the for the forensic practitioner for the court because they have that relationship. Uh, and in terms of the question about instructing the psychiatrist doing the treatment in prison, often you'll find that the psychiatrist in prison will have all the information about how the defendant is every day on the wing that your expert sent into the prison just won't have. And the reports you get from the treating psychiatrist are often much better for it. And what was the final question? I'm, it I'm was. It was about um, it's prejudice. Yeah, well, yes, it, crimes that are considered particularly abhorrent by society. There's a there seems to be a bias against mentally ill offenders who've committed such crimes, and perhaps a, a readiness to impose the purely punitive sanction rather than a, a treatment, simply because of the way the crime is viewed. I mean, do you think there is? Are you prepared to admit that there is such a bias amongst the judiciary or do you think not so much anymore, particularly if one's applying the sentencing guideline? Well, I think what I would say about bias is I think it doesn't matter whether you're a judge or anybody else. I mean, we all have it and, you know, and we've all got to be honest about it and address it uh, and be ruthless about it with ourselves. In terms of the guidelines, don't forget that for those very serious offences, um, you, well, for every offence, you have to look at this, the offence-specific guideline as well uh, as the um, uh, mental health guideline. Mm. Uh, and I would hope that re really a rigorous analysis of um, culpability um, will follow. Uh, and I, I thought the, the example of Lowell, which, of course, was a case from, I think, Judge Carew, wasn't it, in London, that Stella talked about, um, you know, 
that was all of that was very much on the point, wasn't it? You know, this was, as I understand it, I've, I think you might just tell it. It's you know, it's a stranger murder, isn't it? Um, but but with a very you know, but with a very chaotic um, defendant and um, you know, a very a very strict applicability of the guideline. So it's the guy, it's the law that keeps us honest, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Give us the tools and keep us on keep us on our keep us on our toes. There's a, an additional question for you, actually, Judge Jean. Since we've got you back, we'll bombard you with them. Um, I'll read out the question. I'm a I social worker. Oh, someone tells me the Arsenal score. Oh, yes, score. the Arsenal match. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's um, right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a, <laughs> this one reads, um, I'm a social work student. I'm wondering how you determine the hybrid order or at a hospital setting if you do not have the mental health issue of when they enter your courtroom. I'm not entirely sure I'm asking that correctly, but... Um, yeah. Well, I think it's a very good question. It's saying if you don't have a mental health background and training, how on earth are you going to get it right when you're looking at a hybrid? Um, I've been a judge for 10 years. I've never made a hybrid order. Um, and that's not because I haven't had a case where I've had to make the decision. It's just because they're very unusual. But when you have to consider making a hybrid order, that's when you need the experts to really get down and into the detail. And that's what really Heather Hallett was saying, wasn't it? Lady Justice yeah. Hallett in, in the case was really saying that Every, every case turns on its own facts and on the individual and, and the particular treatment. You know, if you're on, if you're on Merseyside, it's going to be different from if you're in London. That's why you need to look at the guidelines, which tells you the questions that the psychiatrists need to be helping you with. And then you can really work out, because if you're talking about public protection, you need to kind of work out which order is going to be the more protective. And you just can't assume anything. You've just got to, it's just very, it's very time consuming. There's just no shortcuts. But these are still rare orders. They are. Um, can I, I, th I think we're out of time, um, but I'd like to just take a little uh, minute to thank all our panellists once again for an extremely interesting talk. Um, and thank you all uh, who uh, attended. Uh, and just um, finally, please come to the annual gen uh, general meeting of Carla on the 19th of May at 5.30. Don't go to the home building one instead. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, for attending today.